When you question the very existence of pathogenic viruses, you've got to be prepared to go after the big fish, and they don't get much bigger than tobacco mosaic virus, proclaimed to be the first virus ever discovered. Around 125 years ago when germ theory was taking off, some papers were written which are pivotal in the virus story. Since that time these papers have been referenced by others as alleged proof of viruses, but there's a startling revelation. It seems unlikely to me that many virus proponents have actually read these papers and might be a bit embarrassed if they did. While there may be dazzling techniques like the PCR and metagenomics in the modern era, there were some major problems with the basics in the historical plant experiments, and it's another fatal blow for the virus theory. Let's start in the present and then work our way back in time to reveal the house of cards this whole thing is built upon. The 2021 Encyclopedia of Virology has a section about tobacco mosaic virus and the beginnings of virology. It opens with, Tobacco mosaic virus occupies a unique place in the history of virology and was in the forefront of virus research since the end of the 19th century. It goes on to state that Ivanovsky was the first person to show that the agent causing the tobacco mosaic disease passed through a sterilizing filter and this gave rise to the subsequent characterization of viruses as filterable agents. In 1939, TMV became the first virus to be visualized in the electron microscope. The encyclopedia goes on to report that in 1956, it was also the first virus to be shown to contain genetic material. The section then provides some pictures and diagrams of what they say is the virus, including a detailed description of its protein coat. There is plenty of information that has been collected about this alleged infectious particle, but where and when was it shown that it is a virus? In the section, replication in cell-to-cell -cell movement of TMV, which should be the key part of the whole thing, there is very scant information. Certainly not enough to prove that this particle they are presenting is a replication competent intracellular parasite that by itself is transmitting between plants and causing mosaic disease. So we'll have to go back in time and keep digging down into the reference trail. Our next paper is a mini review titled 100 Years of Virology that appeared in the Journal of Virology in 1992. It also opens with a paragraph discussing Dmitry Ivanovsky and how he presented a paper before the Academy of Sciences of St. Petersburg in which he stated that the sap of leaves infected with tobacco mosaic disease retains its infectious properties even after filtration through Chamberlain filters. This observation suggested a disease agent smaller than any known before and was the first step in a long series of observations and experiments that led to the discovery of viruses. They go on to say that, although Jacob Henley, a teacher of Robert Koch and grandfather of Werner Henley, had the imagination to conceive of infectious agents with the properties of viruses as early as 1840, these ideas failed to gain acceptance for a lack of experimental evidence. The path to that evidence begins with three scientists independently working on the tobacco mosaic disease, Adolf Meyer, Dmitry Ivanovsky, and Martinus Bejerink. The review also states, Mayer's experiment of inoculating healthy plants with the juice extracted by grinding up leaves from diseased plants was the first experimental transmission of a viral disease in plants. These studies established the infectious nature of the disease, but neither bacterial nor fungal agents could be cultured or detected, and so Cox postulates could not be employed. This gives us some insight into the times. Germ theory was now held in high regard, and if a scapegoat microbe was unable to be seen, then an even smaller contagion was imagined to be at work. Let's jump further back on our tobacco mosaic virus timeline to 1944. Rockefeller Institute scientist and soon to be Nobel Prize winner, Wendell Stanley, published an article in Science titled Soviet Studies on Viruses. 
Perhaps not surprisingly, he cites the Russian Ivanovsky as the key player in the TMV story, showering the following praise on him. I believe that his relationship to viruses should be viewed in much the same light as we view Pasteur's and Koch's relationship to bacteriology. There is considerable justification for regarding Ivanovsky as the father of the new science of virology. To be fair to Stanley, he would not have been aware at this point that Pasteur's work was largely fraudulent, as that was not exposed until the late 1900s, when his notebooks were finally made available to the public. Additionally, Koch never fulfilled his own postulates, as I covered in my video, Cox Postulates, Germ School Dropout. However, I'm not sure these factors would have slowed down Stanley on his tobacco mosaic virus promotions. So we're still not getting to the definitive evidence we need for a virus, and the next jump back on our timeline is to 1938, to Wendell Stanley once again, who delivered a presentation titled Isolation and Properties of Tobacco Mosaic and Other Virus Proteins. He opened by stating that the germ theory of disease emerged so triumphantly based on the allegedly brilliant research of individuals such as Pasteur and Koch. Stanley went on to report that the alleged virus was shown to spread through the following technique. A virus preparation is rubbed by means of a bandage gauze pad over upper surfaces of the leaves. This is the so-called mechanical inoculation technique and already we can see some problems. Firstly, the leaves need to be roughed up a little and then a preparation containing the alleged virus is introduced. So there are far too many variables to consider before claiming it must be a virus that is responsible for subsequent observations. Stanley goes on to report that the virus activity may be determined. Mm, virus activity. I looked up a study from 1937 isolation of crystalline tobacco mosaic virus protein from tomato plants, also by Stanley, purporting to show such activity. And here is where we start to see some of the crazy methodology that this whole thing is built upon. They describe harvesting 200 sick plants said to have the virus, froze them, ground them up, and extracted a total of 210 litres of juice. They precipitated the proteins by adding ammonium sulphate, and put it through a filter which reduced the more than 200 litres of extract to 350 grams. Then they purported to purify their proteins by adding ammonium sulphate and quicklime. They weren't happy with the result, so repeated this several times until they had a crystalline protein. Then they claimed to demonstrate how infectious their virus was based on what different concentrations of their super concentrated plant extract did when rubbed on other plants. Now if we keep in mind that a virus is supposed to be an infectious replication competent obligate intracellular parasite, none of these experiments demonstrate these properties at all. In reality, all they could claim is that they took hundreds of sick plants, made a highly concentrated extract, and then damaged the leaves of other plants by rubbing the potent extract directly onto them. It is so far from what would happen in nature it seems incredible that this is their proof of a virus. But even more crucially, there were no controlled experiments done, so they didn't provide scientific evidence of anything really. Going back to Stanley's 1938 presentation, and we can see that virology was already drifting off course with his following claim. The entire science of chemistry is built upon the recognition of substances by means of such properties. And I consider the recognition of tobacco mosaic virus protein by means of its properties to be as valid as the means used by the bacteriologist to identify a given organism. He seems more interested in chemistry experiments he can perform with his molecules rather than their biological significance, a philosophy that has re-manifested in modern virology with techniques such as the PCR and antibody tests. A little segue would be helpful here to explain some of the changes in viral theory last century. In these pre-1950s publications, they talked about viruses as toxic proteins. As Dr. Stefan Lenker wrote in 2020, the theory of viruses as protein toxins had to be abandoned in 1951. That year, two control experiments were carried out in order to test the toxin virus theory. One, rather than only exposing tissues supposedly damaged by viruses, healthy tissues were also exposed to putrefaction. It was found that the proteins produced by the decomposition of healthy tissue were the same as those produced by the decomposition of virus-damaged tissue. 
This disproved the virus assumption. Two, on top of this, the pre-1951 theory of what a virus is supposed to be was refuted by the fact that no one could ever find or photograph anything different in people or animals supposedly infected with a virus from what can be found or photographed in healthy subjects using the electron microscope. This is still the case today. Also worthy of a mention is the 1935 book Tobacco Diseases and Decay by Frederick Wolf. I enjoyed reading this one because on page 116, the virus hunters get particularly excited about proposing new virology terms including virosate, virosized, virosed, virosized, virosive, virosation, virosization, none of which gained any traction thankfully. The section on tobacco mosaic goes on to describe how if you damage leaves with an infected needle, localized death of the leaf occurs, allegedly due to the TM virus. Again, it is unclear why a virus needs to be invented to explain this finding and how this replicates what happens in nature. Wolf also reports that various species of insects of both biting and sucking types, mostly of the latter, transmit certain of the less easily communicable virus diseases, as typified by the sugar cane mosaic in the curly top of sugar beets. Wouldn't a simpler explanation be that the plants are being damaged by parasitic insects? Things are not looking good on the evidence front for the virus proponents, so now we jump back in our timeline to the 1800s to get amongst the alleged original virus discoverers. In 1898, Martinus Bejerinx produced a paper titled Concerning a Contagium Vivum Fluidum, or Contagious Living Fluid, as Cause of the Spot Disease of Tobacco Leaves. Bejerink describes how he infects plants using a glass syringe and outlines what he claims are a series of incontestable infection experiments as proof of a virus. However, the following seems to go against his hypothesis. He describes how he excluded bacteria from being the causative agent by washing the bacterial colonies with water to remove the viruses before introducing them to plants. I'm not sure a virologist would recognize that as a valid technique. He described vigorously poking the soil around plants with a stick and then presumed that the malformed plant had received large root injuries in the process, through which many entrances may have been opened to the virus. In summary, Bejerink caused plants to become diseased by damaging their roots or injecting them with material from sick plants, finding that, incredibly, the more he did this, the worse the plant looked. In no way did he show how his experiments related to what happens in nature, and fatally he performed no control experiments, so could make no sound scientific claims about any of it. There is only one place left to go, and that is to the person who is said to be the original discoverer of the TM virus, Dmitry Ivanovsky. It was quite hard to get an English copy of his essay, and special thanks to my friend Simon Goddick for helping me with this. The title in English is About the Mosaic Disease of the Tobacco Plant, and I suspect most virologists haven't actually read this original paper, even though many like to cite it. Ivanovsky writes, Among the tobacco plantations I have visited in Russia, I have found mosaic disease in the Crimea and along the east coast of the Black Sea. The mosaic disease does not exist in Little Russia and Bessarabia. We come to the conclusion that this disease finds favourable conditions of existence only in coastal regions. Such a conclusion fully agrees with the above observations concerning the influence of moisture on the development of the disease. Mosaic disease appears to be unique to humid and warm climates. Incredibly, this doesn't lead him to the conclusion that it is the terrain or environmental conditions that make plants sick, and that some plants are much better suited to certain climates than others. No, germ theory must be the explanation, and the virus hunter goes on. He reports that if he cut the worst looking leaves off a plant, then the new growth would still not be healthy, strangely concluding that this was because of a contained pathogen rather than the simple explanation that the plant was malnourished. And how did he demonstrate the transmission of the alleged pathogen between plants? He put sap 
from sick plants into fine capillary tubes and then usually stuck them into the knot of the youngest leaf. If he wanted to stick even more material into a plant, he would use a platinum spatula to traumatize it even more. He reports, the result of the inoculation usually becomes apparent after 11 to 15 days, but sometimes only after three to four weeks, which depends above all on the constitution of the plant, strong or weak, tender, and on external conditions. Here he identifies that the underlying health of the plant and various environmental conditions determine the degree to which the plant gets sick when it is mechanically traumatized. So why is the pathogen boogeyman being introduced? He writes, crushed seeds are capable of producing the disease in healthy plants, but themselves produce perfectly healthy plants. I don't know how to explain this contradiction. Well, it's not a contradiction if there is no virus. He makes the following admission. Despite the fact that the root systems of both plants were closely intertwined, the unvaccinated plant remained healthy. This agrees well with the fact above that the roots do not contain the pathogen. In any case, this experiment shows that the close proximity of a diseased plant poses no danger to the healthy plant. Interesting. So how would this be spreading in nature? Thus, depending on the change in growing conditions, I could obtain deformed or normal development of the leaves. Changing the amount of inoculum never exerted such an effect. The cause of the deformity undoubtedly lies in the nutritional or growth conditions of the plant. Fatally, Ivanovsky's 15,000 word essay does not describe one properly controlled experiment, and although it provides some interesting observations, it does not stack up as scientific evidence. And this is one of the pillars that the whole house of cards of virology has been built upon. The particles that are alleged to be the tobacco mosaic virus may have some relationship to plant disease, but they have never been shown to be replication competent parasites jumping from plant to plant. In other words, they cannot be called viruses. Tobacco mosaic virus is one of the foundational claims of the entire field of virology, but at the root of it, it is built on nothing more than unscientific experiments and propagation of more viral mythology. To help sustain my channel in this time of censorship, please support my work on Subscribestar. Link is in the description. So that we don't lose touch, please find me at drsambailey.com and sign up for my free newsletter.